So what is the life cycle of an IRS audit? Let me walk you through. The first thing is you're gonna receive a letter from the IRS, it's an audit letter, and it'll be from the revenue agent, who's the auditor. You're gonna find their name, their contact information. You're also gonna look at who the letter is addressed to, that's the taxpayer under audit. It could be you individually, it could be a business you have, an entity, maybe a trust. Make sure you identify that. I will tell you if you have a entity, a business entity, like an S-Corp or an LLC, and that income flows through to your personal return, your personal returns should be under audit as well. They should be opening up both because if they make an adjustment on the business return, it's going to flow to your personal return with additional income. The other thing you're going to want to pay attention to are the tax years. There might be a single tax year that's under audit or multiple years. Understand what years because you're going to have to gather records for that. The second thing you're going to do when you get that letter, you're going to contact the revenue agent, again, who's the auditor, and you'll have 10 days to do that. Uh, and you're going to say, look, I don't have time right now to schedule the meeting, but I, and they're going to want to meet with you. I need to schedule this 30, 45 days out. You're going to need time to hire a tax attorney, gather your records. I keep all my records. But when I go back and look at older tax returns, I'm like, you know what? I maybe uh, have some additional questions because I'm looking at my tax return, looking at my, my financials, and there's obviously some missing, potentially some missing pieces. You're going to have to gather additional records. You're going to need the time to do that. You're going to look at your tax return. Look at the income that's reported. Did you report all your income? You can call IRS and get what they call a wage and income transcript for the individual. For the business, you can call and ask for an IRPTR report, IRPTR report, and that's all the income that's reported for that business to the IRS by third parties. Could be 1099 income, all sorts of stuff that is reported will be on that report for the business. Anyways, match up the IRS's records to your tax return, make sure there's no discrepancy. The other thing you're gonna to wanna to do is gather all your records, your expense records. If you have a business, Hopefully you have some accounting records, a general ledger, a profit and loss statement, business bank account statements, business and personal statements. Gather all these together because sometimes people do deposit business income in a personal account and IRS is very aware of that. They're going to want to verify whether all the income has been reported. That's the number one function they're going to have. Secondly, they're going to want to look at your expenses. On the personal return, you might have your mortgage interest deduction. You might have some uh, donations to charity. You might have to pull up the checks if you wrote a check to a charity or a letter that you got back from the charity, and sometimes they want both. These things have to be substantiated, the numbers on your return. That's why there's an audit. Actually, so why was there an audit? Because the IRS's computer, which is an algorithm, flagged something on your return that was an outlier compare, compared to other people. Or maybe you previously filed your return not reporting certain income, or maybe, uh, maybe you reported additional losses, something got triggered maybe between the different years for you, or that you're an outlier compared to other people. <clears throat> That's generally the synopsis of it. Once you've done that, hopefully you're gonna hire a tax attorney, go through the records with them, explain how you do business if you have a business, you know, what is, how you're generating income and how you, uh, what kind of expenses you have. Bring some meaning to the expenses because it's not always relevant, I'm sorry, it's not always clear uh, when we have cases, why taxpayers, why business owners are reporting certain expenses, There's definitely every company is run differently. Explain all that. Next, you're going to have a meeting with the IRS. They're going to want to interview you. And if you have a good tax attorney, hopefully that meeting can get pushed out a little bit. Sometimes the IRS revenue agent does demand to have a, a person in-person meeting with the taxpayer and the POA, they call the power of attorney representative, which is usually a tax attorney, could be a CPA. Um, but they're, they're going to want to have certain answers. They're going to, you know, and the questions they're going to want to answer. You know, do you have any foreign bank accounts? Do you use cryptocurrency? Were you paid in cryptocurrency? Uh, where, where do you bank? Because if you don't provide, for instance, the bank statements to the IRS, they'll just simply go summons it, and it'll take 30 or 45 days. Do you have a safe at home? Do you keep a lot of cash? Not that it is relevant for your tax return, but there might be some indication if you do have a lot of cash, you're handling a lot of cash, either because of a business that you have or just in general, that might trigger some of the questions the IRS have. I will tell you the cryptocurrency is one that will take a lot of time. And if you have a, a crypto account and especially a decentralized wallet, you can expect a whole other series of questions that are going to come from that. Once you've met with the IRS, they're going to send you what they call an IDR, an information document request, which is a list of all the documents and information the IRS is asking for. And again, if you don't respond to that within a timely matter, so you want to negotiate how much time you have, 30 days is probably acceptable. You might be able to get more if there's anything complicated but you just don't want to delay and you don't want to ignore those requests. Very important because the IRS will summons it from the third parties or the banks. And then once you provided all that information, they'll be back and forth between you or if you hire a tax attorney between you and your rep uh, and the IRS. There's always going to be questions that arise. You'll provide bank statements, you'll provide expense receipts, and they might have questions say, hey, look, I'm not understanding 
the transaction. So there's going to be information that needs to be responded to uh, to IRS to explain these things. But a good tax attorney will be able to anticipate these questions ahead of time. And with the documents, provide an explanation, expecting that these questions are going to arise. That's going to solve a lot of problems and hopefully shorten down the uh, time the audit will take. Personal audits, probably four to six months, simple audits. A business audit or a personal and a business, six months to 12 months, maybe even longer. It depends on the issues and how complex your return is. Uh, once you've kind of gone back and forth and hopefully come to a resolution, IRS will issue a revenue agent report, an RAR. You're going to want to review that very carefully. You're going to have a short amount of time. You might have 30 days, you might have less to respond to the IRS and say, look, I disagree with your adjustments. Maybe they increased your income. Maybe they found cash coming in as deposits and they couldn't be traced to any other uh, income. And this is in excess of what you reported on your income tax return. You're going to have to resolve those. And if you can't come to a resolution, you have two choices. You can submit what they call a protest letter, which then will uh, got to be timely. And then that will allow IRS to send the file over to IRS Appeals, which is like kind of like mediation, and try to resolve those issues with IRS Appeals. IRS Appeals' function is to mitigate any litigation has, uh, you know, risk of litigation. That if, the, if you took it to court, there's a risk the IRS would lose. That's what appeals' function is, to try to resolve issues so we don't have to go to court. Um, and if it can be resolved, and a lot of things do get resolved with IRS appeals. Different function, different focus. Um, and the other choice you have is instead of submitting a protest letter, you can tell IRS, I want to go to U.S. tax court, and they'll issue what they call a, a notice of deficiency, an NOD. You'll have 90 days from the date of that NOD to go file a tax court petition and go to tax court. You'll file your petition with the court and they will push you back to appeals, but it's going to be what they call a docketed case. It's a docketed case that's been filed with the tax court. The hearings are going to be between nine months and 12 months out from the date you file your petition. And then you're going to be working with IRS appeals. And if it can't be resolved, you go to tax court. In both scenarios, you have the opportunity to go to appeals and tax court. As long as you file a timely and as long as you follow the rules, because the petition requires certain, um, certain language in there uh, under penalty of perjury that the facts are true and correct, that has to be included with that petition. Otherwise, it's disregarded. So make sure you hire a tax attorney, go through the issues, make sure you got your documents. But that's generally the life cycle. And hopefully this information was useful. I'm John Malikowski, founder of Malikowski Tax Law.